Okay, well, thanks very much for organizing this event and for the invitation, and uh, thanks for attending this meeting. Um, as you know, machine learning has been uh, really successful in uh, giving us predictions, but uh, over the past few years, there's been a lot of interest in using machine learning as well for evaluating the effects of treatments or exposures on, on certain outcomes. And this is what I'll talk about. Um, the reason why there's so much interest in it is, uh, is obviously partly because machine learning has shown to be quite successful, but also because there's been quite major discoveries, both in biostatistics and econometrics, that has um, given us a lot of insight how to use machine learning in the evaluation of treatment effects. And so today I'm going to review a bit of this work, uh, which is um, not really my work. Um, and at the end, if time allows, I'll talk a little bit about what we are doing um, in uh, both in Ghent and uh, at the London School of Hygiene um, on, on this topic with uh, Oliver Dukes, he's a PhD student who just graduated last week and I think he was sharing office with the previous speaker at some point <coughs> in time. Okay, so here is a problem I'm going to focus on. I'll focus on the effect of a treatment, which I'll call A. This is going to be a dichotomous treatment, so either you get treatment, yes or no, on a certain outcome. And ideally, what I would like to do is to contrast for the same person the outcome Y1 if I would treat that person versus the outcome Y0 if I would not treat that person. And so if I was able to make this contrast for the same person and I could do this for a number of people, then eventually I could take the average. And that's what I'll call the average causal effects. Obviously, we cannot really do this because we can only see people with or without treatment, but not both. And this is why we sort of try to get close to this scenario in practice by trying to compare people who are similar in terms of a number of variables, which I'll call L. So L is a number of variables that I want to control for that would typically be differently distributed between treated and untreated subjects. Um, and so hopefully by comparing treated and untreated subjects who are identical in those confounders, we, we do get a fair comparison. I'm really oversimplifying the problem. Uh, going back to the last question that was posed, which was a, a really good question, I'm ignoring complications uh, such as that there may be variables that we should better not adjust for. I'm, I'm going to assume in this talk that I have a whole collection of variables that I'm allowed to adjust for, but hopefully there's a subset that uh, is also sufficient to adjust for confounding. In that sense, I call the confounders high dimensional because I could have many, but also high dimensional because there could be some continuous variables whose relationship with the outcome is pretty complicated. Now, two popular approaches in practice in epidemiology are standardization and inverse weighting, and I'll briefly review those before linking or bringing in machine learning. So standardization, let me explain how we estimate the mean of Y1, the average outcome if everyone in the population were treated. Well, how we do this is as follows. On the picture here, you can see treated subjects. These are the triangles. And there's also bullets over here. Uh, these are the untreated subjects. Because I'm interested in learning what happens on treatment, we would fit a model uh, to predict, predict the outcome in the treated population and how that relates to the confounders we have. Uh, so that's basically what I'm doing here with the linear regression, just to get started. And then we would use the model to predict the outcome for all the people in the study, because I'm trying to learn what would happen in the whole population. So I would predict outcome for both treated and untreated people based on my model, and then I would average those predictions. That's how standardization works. Because we use predictions in the first step, uh, we can obviously use m machine learning methods as well to help us there. And uh, the picture here shows a slightly more complicated model where I'm, I'm using splines to, um, to make predictions. But again, the principle is the same. We use the predictions which are sitting on the line. We, we, we evaluate them for all people in the study and take the average of those at the end of the day. In the talk, I'm going to use machine learning in a very broad sense. So um, it could be things like random forests or neural nets, but it could also be simpler analysis like using splines or, or doing variable selection methods uh, or using lasso. Anything where I'm using the data to help me judge what model would be appropriate um, is what I'll refer to as machine learning. Inverse weighting works differently. So to estimate, again, the average outcome if everyone was treated, we could also 
um, evaluate the chance of being treated and how that depends on the covariate data, which are here on the x-axis. Um, because um, most people are treated, uh, while well, most treated people are sitting on the right, so we would have large probabilities on the right, but small ones on the left. And so what we do is we could average the outcomes for the treated people, giving weights one over this probability. So we give large weights to the people on the left um, because they try to um, make up for the, uh, the untreated people who are mostly sitting on the left. And, and in that sense, um, again, we have a, a way of estimating the average outcome. But you can see that, again, in the first step, I'm using um, basically a sort of prediction, if you like, and we could use machine learning to help us there. So for now, I could say machine learning seems to make quite sense. Uh, because model misspecification is quite a big problem in the evaluation of treatment effects. And you can especially see this over here because um, when we go to the left, there is no treated people. And so we're really extrapolating to learn how the untreated people would have done uh, who are sitting over here. So there's a lot of extrapolation potentially happening. And in that sense, model misspecification is quite likely and, and difficult to diagnose. Another reason why I think machine learning is quite attractive is because it's a fairly objective way of doing the data analysis. At least we could sort of pre-specify before we do, before we even see the data, we could pre-specify what machine learning algorithm we are going to use. And maybe that would allow for a more fair strategy. In contrast, the, the usual process of building models um, involves a lot of ad hoc choices and would be hard to pre-specify in practice. Finally, if you do like to use your own statistical methods and, and models and bring in the clinical expertise that you have on a topic, well, that, that seems like a very good idea. But you could still say, well, we can balance the predictions that we have obtained ourselves with the um, predictions obtained from more flexible machine learning methods and take the best of those um, as, as uh, we can learn by cross-validation, for instance. Or we could use something like ensemble learners who sort of picks the best of all predictions that we have obtained or, or takes some optimal linear combination of them. However, there's a, there's a few caveats, and I'm going to mention two caveats. One is obvious. If we use machine learning to evaluate treatment effects, well, then it's very easy to get an estimate, but it's very difficult to get a standard error and confidence interval. Um, the standardization that, that I was doing was um, predicting the outcome. So let me call the prediction m hat of L. Well, then we would estimate the average outcome on treatment um, as just an average of those predictions. So that would be very easy to do. But calculating standard error would be very difficult to do. It may be tempting to, since we're just calculating a standard, uh, since we're just calculating a sample average, it might be tempting to say, let's take the standard deviation of the prediction. <coughs> overrule n as a standard error, but obviously that's not going to work because it's ignoring the uncertainty in the prediction in the machine learning algorithm, and it's very difficult to get a sense of uh, how accurate these predictions are. It's also tempting to consider use of the bootstrap, but unfortunately bootstrap has no justification when machine learning is part of the process. So in that sense, we might also say, well, let's go back to our old school statistical analysis, which uh, could be perfectly sensible. But even there, um, our usual uh, uncertainty margins, the way how we calculate confidence intervals, only works if the model is, is pre-specified. And in practice, that would often not be the case. So even there, um, I think we have an issue. The more subtle caveat is the following. Uh, machine learning has been designed to do prediction, and it's working very well for that purpose. But it's not been designed to deliver treatment effect estimates with low bias. And you can see some evidence of this over here, because I was fitting a model, or I was running a machine learning algorithm, if you, if you like, to the treated people who are mostly sitting on the right. But the machine learning algorithm is not aware that later in the process, I'm going to make predictions for all people in the study, including the untreated people who are sitting on the left. And this is just simulated data. In fact, I've simulated the data such that there is no treatment effect. And so I know that the curve should actually go up here and, and pick up the points that go in this direction. But it's not doing this very well because we have no treated people. And I'm only fitting the model to the treated people. 
Um, so because of this, we end up with uh, what, I, what I tend to call plug-in bias. We, get a, we obtain a bias in treatment effect estimates as a result of plugging in machine learning fits um, into, into the analysis. You could view this a bit, this plug-in bias, as the consequence of oversmoothing the data in the region where I'm making prediction. We have oversmoothed the data in this region because we just had no data. Um, for treated people over there. A very related problem is that um, in the analysis, it's, it may be very likely that we kick out important confounders, maybe variables that are not so helpful to give us good predictions, but variables that are really very important to adjust for in the evaluation of treatment effects. There could be variables that are very strongly associated with treatment and more weakly associated with outcome, well, machine learning algorithms are not going to pick those up, but they are really essential to, uh, to do a, a good confounding adjustment. An obvious solution could be to under-smooth. That is, um, if we build models, we could say, let's try to select more variables, or, or let's allow for more wiggly functions to, um, uh, to pick up um, non-linearities in the data. But as you know, this is going to make the estimates more variable and it's not even so clear how much undersmoothing we would then require and in what regions of the data space uh, we would need to undersmooth. So that, that could be a solution, but not an obvious one. One could also argue that this problem of bias um, due to kicking out variables from the analysis is maybe not such a big problem if we have lots of data. And indeed, this plug-in <coughs> bias gets smaller as we collect more data. So. If we're reasoning asymptotically, maybe it seems tempting to say maybe it's not such a big problem. But it is a pretty big problem because um, theoretical results show that the, the amount of plug-in bias can very easily exceed the magnitude of your standard errors. So even if you have a lot of data, um, we would have small standard errors uh, potentially for that reason. Uh, but we, we would often have more bias, or we could easily have more bias on the standard error. And that means that if we calculate confidence intervals, that they might be very tight, but positioned in completely the wrong place. Um, and so we may end up with confidence <coughs> intervals that are seemingly very accurate, but uh, are never containing the truth. And we just had a small look at this in, um, in the analysis of a big data set. Um, where we analyzed the whole sample and, and essentially viewed the result as the truth. Um, and then we subsampled and, and did variable selection um, and looked at coverage of confidence intervals after running Lasso, uh, where we do see evidence that confidence intervals cover less than they should, um, which is potentially an implication of this plug-in bias. The, the fact that we may not be you know, adjusting for all the confounders that we should. Again, it may be tempting to say, well, given all these problems, maybe we should go back to our old statistical analysis, which may very well make sense. But again, uh, that would only work if the model is pre-specified. And in practice, this is not what we typically end up doing. So I'm just trying to say that these issues are also there in our usual statistical analysis. So the summary so far is I think machine learning brings useful perspectives. Um, for controlling better for confounding and also for enabling a more objective analysis because we could perhaps pre-specify the algorithm that we're going to use. Um, but there's also big issues. Um, obtaining honest as uncertainty assessments like confidence intervals is very tricky. Um, we could easily obtain estimators that have a, a lot of bias because of not approximating the truth sufficiently well. Bias because of the machine learning alg algorithm not being really tuned to the um, problem of estimating treatment effects. Uh, as I said, standard errors are very difficult to calculate. Um, the estimators could easily have complicated mixture distributions and not the usual normal distributions that we like to work with. And I don't think there's a really simple remedy for that. However, th there is one remedy that I do want to talk about uh, and that has been really influential over the past few years in both biostatistics and, um, and um, 
econometrics, and it goes back, in fact, to the 80s, 90s, where math, uh, in mathematical statistics there was a lot of work on the use of plug-in estimators. A bit like in, um, when I talked about standardization, uh, when I was plugging in machine learning algorithms and then calculating a sampler average, that kind of, that type of estimators, if you like, uh, were considered to a great extent in non-parametric statistics, mostly, I think, in the context of coronal weighting and so forth. And uh, this uh, very important and influential work by Peter Bickle, Whitney Newey, Jamie Robbins, uh, uh, Andrei Aronitsky, Arnd van der Waard, these are just a few people. Mark van der Laan has been um, really clever in, um, in basically picking up that he could make use of that theory to combine machine learning and treatment effect evaluation. And he came up with a whole framework which he calls targeted maximum likelihood estimation, which is um, getting quite popular in epidemiology and biostatistics. More recently, there's been uh, an extension, I would say, of that work by Alexander Belloni, Victor Chernozukov, Jamie Robbins again, uh, Whitney Newey, um, who basically made this work under weaker conditions, and, uh, and to achieve that, they made use of sample splitting, which I'll explain in, in a minute. And they refer to the, their approach as double machine learning. So this is a real hype this uh, today, especially in, uh, in econometrics. So let me tell you a little bit about double machine learning, of which I view TMLE, uh, target maximum likelihood, as a special case. So double machine learning, the name comes from the fact that it uses double robust estimators. So these are specific estimators of treatment effect that rely on two predictions, if you like. Uh, typically a propensity score, as we call it, which is uh, the probability of being treated given confounders. And then an outcome prediction, the average outcome in the treated given confounders. And they have the nice property that the amount of bias that those estimators have as a result of model misspecification, is roughly like a product of the bias in one prediction and the bias in the other prediction. I mean, how much bias do we have in the propensity score and how much bias do we have in the outcome mean? And because the bias of the treatment effect is roughly like a product of both, it means that if one algorithm gives me unbiased estimator, then my treatment effect is going to be unbiased as well. So we don't need both models to, to be correct or we don't need both machine learning algorithms to converge to the truth necessarily to end up with uh, an unbiased result. And so what is double machine learning? Well, double machine learning just means we're going to use a double robust system made of treatment effect, but we will obtain these two guys here, the propensity score and outcome mean by machine learning. I'm not sure if there's any people in the room who have ever used double robust estimators. Well, most of you are probably wrong because um, <laughs> something like ordinary least squares is a special case of a double robust estimator. So there's in fact a, a number of very popular <laughs> estimators that turn out to be special cases of double robust estimators. So I just want to point out that it's nothing too fancy. <laughs> <laughs> but let me give you an idea. Um, back to the context I was describing. Um, how would um, double robustness work? Well. We would start evaluating this propensity score, which tells me what percentage of people is treated. And then um, I would predict the outcome for the treated people. But in fitting the model, I would use weights. The weights I was using before, one of the probability of treatment I use as a weight. And so when I now do my linear regression, which is clearly a very bad choice of model, the fact that I'm assigning large weights here means that my algorithm is going to do a better job at making a prediction for all people, if you like. So what I did before, without the weighting, gave me this regression curve. And uh, I'm, I still have a bad model, but it's going to give me better predictions for treatment effect evaluation. Same if we use a more complicated model, and I'm using smoothing splines here. This is what happens if I use the weighting, but previously, without the weighting, we got this. And again, we're better able to pick up uh, what's happening in the region where the untreated people lie, which is quite important because, again, we're, we're making predictions for both treated and untreated people. So in that sense, we can remove a bit of plug-in bias, if you like. 
I'll also give you an impression from more like a, a just a quick simulation study, which I'll, uh, I'll explain in a, in a minute why I chose this particular one. Uh, but here I'm doing like a linear regression, but there's a complicated relation with the covariates as well as the relation between exposure and covariates is fairly complicated as well. There are 10 covariates and uh, 500 samples. And here, Dublin Machine Learning basically works by evaluating this uh, calculation where we get both this prediction of the treatment and this prediction of the outcome we would obtain by machine learning. I'll first to do it without machine learning. So if I do ordinary least squares, then over a thousand simulations, this is where the estimates end up, and the truth is 0 0.5. So we're not doing really very good. But if I'm using machine learning in a more naive way, using random forests here, then we're not really doing any better. Um, if I use the double machine learning, then we remove that plug-in bias to some extent. I'm not saying that we take all, away all the bias, but you can see that the results shift in the, in the right direction. So why double machine learning? Well, um, the good thing is that they are not so vulnerable to this plug-in bias. Uh, Plug-in bias, again, which originates from the fact that the machine learning was designed to give predictions, but was not designed to give treatment effects with low bias. And again, why do we have small plug-in bias? Well, because of what I said before, these double robust estimators have a bias which is roughly a product of two bias terms. Um, both these biases in the propensity score and outcome will be relatively small if we have a sufficient amount of data. And small times small means even smaller. So in that sense, we are shrinking bias um, through that product. Because we take away that plug-in bias, interestingly, the variability of um, the estimator that we obtain uh, in this way is not really affected by the choice of algorithm. So in particular, suppose that I told someone in the room what the true predictions were the true propensity score and the true outcome regression. And then the person evaluated the treatment effects. And all the others had, didn't have that information and used machine learning to get there. Well, they should get estimators with the same variability. Um, and that's good news because it means if we calculate standard errors, we can pretend as if someone gave us the predictions. And thus we can ignore that machine learning was used along the way, which is quite helpful because machine learning is so complicated, so uh, we don't quite know um, how, how good it is, it is doing. The estimators also have a normal distribution asymptotically, which <coughs> means we can calculate confidence intervals in a, in a fairly standard way. So there's a few buts as well. So let me talk a little bit about the caveats and the drawbacks of this approach. So one issue is that if we make um, the modeling very fancy and complicated, then um, there is a risk that the estimators end up with another type of bias, which is sometimes called own observation bias. It's a sort of overfitting bias. It's basically a bias that arises because we use the data twice. We use the data to run the machine learning, and then we also use the same data to evaluate treatment effects. And this is inducing bias, um, which, um, let me just skim over this, which can be avoided by sample splitting. So sample splitting means we can cut our data sets randomly in half, use one half of the data to run the machine learning, and use the other half to do the evaluation of the treatment effects. Um, we can obviously change the roles of the, um, the two samples. I can now use the other sample to run my machine learning and the first sample to evaluate treatment effect. And in this way, I would get two treatment effect estimators and it turns out that the average of both um, is equally precise in a sense as if we hadn't done sample splitting. So the point I want to make is, in principle, sample splitting uh, has no price that comes with it because we get estimators that are, uh, in terms of variability, equally good. However, in practice, I'm pretty concerned about the sample splitting because, of course, if you split your data set in half, then I'm, I'm going to pick up many fewer confounders. Um, and I do have a big concern that this will leave a lot of residual bias. The asymptotics looks nice, but I think there's a big discrepancy still between what the asymptotics uh, 
um, the real finite sample settings tells me. Let me go back to the simulation. Um, what I didn't tell you is I, I took this simulation, the data generating mechanism from the web, because uh, someone posted on the web um, a setting where sample splitting would clearly improve on, um, uh, you know, he showed it, or he or she, I, I, I'll, I'll not mention uh, the name, <laughs> uh, showed a setting where you got awful results without sample splitting and very nice results. Um, with the sample splitting. But when I looked at the code, there was actually an error in the code. And uh, <laughs> this, is, this is how I think it ought to be. So in blue, you can now see what happens with sample splitting, which uh, uh, in principle, according to the theory, should make things better. But, um, but there's a price to pay, as I said, because uh, if you cut your data set in half, there's going to be over smoothing as a result. Um, so that's one caveat. Uh, the second is the whole theory is based on both machine learning algorithms delivering predictions that go to the truth. So if you give me enough data, the prediction should equal the truth. And I think this is implausible for many common algorithms because in practice, um, like if we use splines, we're not going to do 10-dimensional splines. We're, we're putting limits on how far we go in the modeling. Um, if we if we use lasso in more parametric models, then for sure there could be uh, good reasons why the predictions are not going to converge to the truth. You might say, well, um, if we're using very flexible algorithms um, like deep learning or whatever, then maybe this um, the fact that both algorithms need to go to the truth is perhaps less demanding. But again, I'm um, I'm pretty concerned about it because there's some evidence um, in the context of double robust estimation that um, if one of the algorithms gives poor approximations that it could really mess up the results. And so I think this is still a concern. I started off saying we, we have double robustness and so only one of the models needs to be correct. But for valid inference, it seems that both need to be correct, which is a bit demanding. Finally, um, the last sort of condition that the theory relies on is that uh, both machine learning algorithms should give predictions that go sufficiently fast to the truth. Um, I'll maybe not say too much about this. Um, too fast, uh, sufficiently fast basically means if you take the bias on both predictions and square it and average it across people, then what you, sh what you obtain as a result um, so I'm, I'm taking the squared bias, take the product, then what I find should be, um, even if I'm multiplying by the sample size, should be a very small number. That will not tell you very much probably, um, but um, what's maybe good to know is that this is a lot better than what the results back in the 80s allowed for, because it allows for, suppose that we know that one of the predictions goes very fast, then the other is allowed to converge very slowly. So let me make this a little more concrete. Suppose that I had some knowledge that physicians only use the few variables to decide on treatment. Well, then I would know that my treatment model might be fairly simple. At least it might contain few variables. And if that is the case, then I know that this prediction is going to converge fast as a, as a result. It, and it means that uh, I can easily allow for very complicated outcome models um, uh, instead. The downside, however, is uh, typical machine learning algorithms are black box and they have unknown statistical properties under some very um, clever work in this area, but still uh, the results that I know in the context of random forests and so forth, um, still look at overly simplistic settings or simplifications of the algorithms. So I don't think we know very well if this condition is ever met in practice. Um, and of course, that's another caveat. We don't really know if that fast convergence is really attained in practice. So in view of this, uh, but I'm not gonna go through all of this, I'll just, briefly mention what we're sort of trying to do. Uh, so in view of this, we are um, developing methods um, 
that avoid sample splitting um, to the extent possible and that do not demand double convergence to the truth. So we only require one of the two algorithms to go to the truth. And uh, we work on the simple settings to start with parametric models with lasso, with smoothing splines, so that we can get better grips on the conditions uh, when the uh, convergence rate is attained. So summary, I think uh, machine learning is quite promising in uh, causal inference and uh, evaluation of treatment effects, but it requires care. There's a lot of subtleties um, that I've only learned about recently. Um, TMLE and double machine learning, I think, are really huge steps forward. I think um, um, in terms of the reading I've been doing, uh, there's, there's some of the greatest achievements I've learned about in the, in the last uh, one or two decades. So they have the nice property that they remove plug-in bias, which is um, very common when we use flexible data adaptive methods in a statistical analysis. And they have the nice <coughs> property that they give us a very easy way to assess uncertainty of the resulting effect estimates. Standard errors, confidence intervals are almost like a hand calculation at the end of the day. Uh, it's al it almost has a simplicity of calculating a standard error of a sample average. Um, so that's quite nice because and quite important because um, these machine learning algorithms are so complicated that we wouldn't otherwise know how exactly to evaluate the uncertainty. There's a lot of remaining work to be done, I think, um, to better tune the machine learning algorithms, not for prediction, but for treatment effect estimation. I do believe that sample splitting uh, is, um, is nice asymptotically, but has, uh, has big limitations. And I don't think there's a very good understanding how theory matches practice. So I think there's also a lot of work to be done in terms of evaluating how well these methods are doing. If any people are interested in learning more about this, you're very welcome to get in touch. Thank you.